Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to the stream. How's everyone doing today? I uh, hope everyone is being safe and everyone is well. So uh, <clears throat> I want to, again, say thank you for being a part of the stream and being here with me for wild and craziness and wacky ride we're about to go on here. So... Uh, this stream is going to be really about some particular feature that was actually brought up in my last stream last Tuesday about uh, a feature with inside of ZBrush. And actually, ironically, there was a couple other people that emailed me about the same feature. So I'm like, you know, let's make this the topic. Uh, and then we're going to expand upon that. Uh, and I want to talk about using ZBrush to do like seamless texturing, but it's not going to just be only that you can use it to do seamless normal maps and you can use uh, speculars and many other things so i want to look at a plugin and specifically we're going to look at the nano tile plugin in this stream so um i want to make sure everyone is able to get this plugin because this plugin actually does not ship with zbrush you have to go get it so I'm going to share where you guys can go get this. So let me move my mouse over here to the other screen. Uh, and then I'll show you where you go exactly to get this. So that you all can, if you want to follow along, you can follow along. If you want to just get it later on, get it later on and sit back and grab some popcorn and listen to my annoyingness that I love. What's going on, Randy? Thanks for joining Hey, Hugo, thank you. So, so all means, I want to make sure, A, I can see the video is fine. I want to make sure audio is good for everybody. Anybody having any audio issues before we start diving into this? Everyone's good. Uh, if someone can just give me a thumbs up, all good. You know, uh, anything so I can know that for sure you're all, you're all good to go in there. I don't have anybody with any audio issues before we start diving into this. At first... Okay, so uh, I'm excited for this because this is a plugin that Mr. Joseph Dress wrote. Uh, pff, now it was almost five years ago, four years ago, um, and it's some it's it's helped me out a lot uh, for things that I've wanted to do in artwork that I've done over the years. Okay, so obviously Pixelogic.com is where you want to go to get this plugin. All right, and in the top here you have a support section. Okay, and then so this is where you can get support yourself, go get information about your licenses. Okay. Uh, which one is first, Facebook or Twitch? It's different. Mm, are you talking about the stream? Well, I'm streaming to multiple platforms. So I don't know if you're on, they're all the same. There, there's no difference. If, so if you're watching this Facebook, Twitch, or YouTube, or even on the ZBrush Live channel itself, there's no difference. It's all the same. It's just one gets the feed sometimes faster than another based upon the servers. Okay. So what I'm going to do is here, go to the support, and then we want to go here to our resources. And in here, you're going to be able to get a several things. Okay. So obviously you can come here and get a link to go to your downloads for ZBrush itself. Um, that though, you should be going through my licenses page. You all should probably be used to that by now. Uh, but over here, there are other things through, through here. So there is, you know, Madcap library where you guys can go download some Madcap libraries through here as well. So we made this. This is really old. This is, I want to say, 11 years ago we started doing this Madcap library. Maybe 10 years ago. Same thing with the alpha little library that we have in here. So there's different types of alphas that you can use. Um, then, of course, there's different textures, right, that you're going to be able to use. And there's categories for them. So... The great resources here. So what we want to go to is go to the ZBrush plugins. Okay. And I'm just going to scroll down to the bottom. So you can see these are just giving you all the plugins that already ship with ZBrush. So if we were ever to do anything where there's a plugin that ships with ZBrush and maybe there's an issue with the plugin for whatever reason it might be, this is where we would come. So like say for Polygroup It, so you can download an updated version um, to this Polygroup It plugin. And... This is where we'll put if there's been an issue with certain plugins that allows you to go and get an update to it. 
Okay, if we're not already updating itself inside of any updates that we do. So obviously right now for ZBrush, we're in 2020.1.1 and ZBrush Core, we're in ZBrush Core 2020.1.2. So you obviously want to have the most recent versions. So again, you're just going to scroll down here to the bottom, keep going through and you're going to go through the plugins that already are installed with ZBrush. And then there's a, a grip of just as many plugins that aren't installed with ZBrush. Uh, so these are where other plugins you can get like ZBrush Composer, the Quick Scaler. So this is great for like jewelers or even people that want specific scaling sizes for insert mesh brushes. Uh, the Kiko Metal is really also for like jewelers, people dealing with metal. It will give you a quote of what it costs to make something in gold or silver. Your piece, a layer brush depth um, is another one. And then there's Ringmaster. But the one we're going to be looking at is this one right here. It is our nano tile, nano, 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 nano. So this one right here is what we want to look at. So you can download by clicking on this button right here. Okay. And of course there are other plugins in here. Um, Z startup master, clean tool, IMM extractor, Z repeat it. So you can see there's a, there's a bunch of here, other plugins here. Okay. That you can do and download. So, a, this is a great resource just overall in general, okay? So <clears throat> you'll want to have that and you're going to want to install that in your ZBrush. Uh, so here, I'll just, you know, just, I didn't plan on it, but let me show you specifically where that's going, okay? So here's my program file. So right now I'm on the Windows side. So obviously on the Macintosh side, you'd be in applications. And you're going to go to your Pixelogic folder and depending on what you have, you're going to go to your ZBrush 2020 or 2020.1 or 2020.1.1. Everyone's going to have a different folder there. Not everyone's going to have 2020.1.1 folder. So don't freak out. That's fine. Okay. So you have this right here. And then you're going to go into your Z startup. Then you're going to go into your Z plugs. And then this is where you're going to ins install that plugin. So when you unzip it, you're going to have a folder. And within that folder, you're going to have the actual folder that you need to put in here, which is a data folder. So you're going to have a nano, this one, nano, nano tile, nano, 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 nano tile textures data. Okay. And then you're going to have a script file as well. Nano tiles textures. All right. So you want to make sure you, you have those separate inside of this particular folder. So it's going to go in your, again, your ZBrush 2020, whatever you're going to have, 2020.1.11, and then Z Startup and Z Plugs. And make sure you're separating them. So when you want to do that zip, again, everyone, this is a Lisa Needs Braces moment, people. Everyone pay attention to me, right? When you unzip it, you're going to have a folder that's just a nano tile install folder with an, a text file. You need to make sure you go in that folder and take the folder out of there which is the one I've just shown you and the script file. If you do not do that, it will not work. Um, Abraham, if you want to, on YouTube, talking about the layer system, if, if there's something specifically you want to ask about that, put it, go ahead, throw your questions in. Again, I'm all about going in tangents for this too. So you guys got me for at least two hours. So I want to focus on using, excuse me, using this plugin to make seamless textures, normal maps, albedos, um, speculars, many multiple other maps. Okay. And then I also want to give this opportunity to show how to take this stuff and then also use it with inside of ZBrush. And I'm going to show you guys a couple other techniques that I like to do to make things for using this, uh, actual nano tile or nano, nano, nano. Okay. So I want to walk you through these settings here and what they can do for you and how they're going to work for you. Okay. And that way you have an understanding of these. And hopefully, you know, after this, you guys create your own uh, tileable elements that you can use within any other application you want to. Because some of the features in this are actually for exporting out if you want to, using ZBrush in essence to create tileable items to go out and maybe an engine or something like that. Okay, so it's it's pretty straightforward. It's not too complicated. Um, but I'm going to pretty much go through all the major buttons here for you to make sure it's possible to do this. Okay. Um, so already a great question. I'm already feeling like we're going to go on 
like a tangent. <laughs> I'm looking at the questions coming through, and I already see it going. I'm like, that's that's a good question. Uh, <clears throat> so, Chris is asking a question: Is it possible to make fire mesh sculptable and printable? And the answer to that is yes, a hundred percent. That's that's you know what, darn it, you know, this is a call for uh, already out the gate, people. Tangent. Okay, so. Because you're bragging, we'll come back to this. Don't worry, we're not going to leave the nano tile, but so I don't want to break the concentration of the nano tile, so I might as well just go right into this fire mesh question because I think it's a great question. People do ask me this question, and being what you do for a living, you know, if you are a person like me that's 3D printing all the time, this is important that you know that you could use something like fibers to make stuff that is printable. Okay, so uh, fire mesh can be used for a lot of things. And there's a lot of tricks, a lot of techniques that, uh, that we can go about using this, okay? So I just want to first go through what Chris is asking specifically, all right, so that you guys can get an understanding of this. So I'm going to throw on my symmetry. I'm going to do a quick mask. So I've just got symmetrical masking happening, okay? So we're going to go into our tool, and we're going to go into fiber mesh, all right? And you're going to have the menu that pops open, and there are submenus there. Okay, so you got these submenus that are happening. So there's many things you're gonna be able to do within here. So obviously the big one and the scary one is what I like to call the cockpit, okay, which is the modifiers one. This is like, I call it a cockpit because when you look at, I don't know if any of you have ever flown, I've flown and I've flown a plane and it's kind of, you know, when you first look at it, you're like, oh, I don't know what anything is doing, right? Which is understandable. It's the same thing when you open a new piece of software. I don't know what's going on. So I like it when I'm even teaching myself a new piece of software. It's like, okay, there's a lot of levers here. and What the heck do all of them do? I have no idea, right? So I want to kind of just quickly break down this a little bit, okay? And then I'll go through and it'll, maybe it'll help clarify some things for you. And this is also going to help you understand how you could use fiber mesh for uh, 3D, 3D printing, okay? So... The first thing we're going to do is there are rules involved when you're creating fiber mesh, okay? And I've made my rules for myself. It's like it's six rules in essence for me. Okay? So I'm this is just me as an artist, me as a person as a developer. I found hey, I follow these six things. I always can pretty much get to where I'm trying to go with fiber mesh uh, with a little bit maybe using the grooming brushes afterwards, okay? So, um um, first, you know what, I'm going to just change, let me turn off the screen saver for now. And also, you know what, quick saves, I don't need that many. So we'll go a duration of 40 minutes and a restoration of, we'll say, 30 minutes. That's, that's enough for me for what we're doing. All right, so I've got a mask. So that's one of the rules. Where you're masking is where fibers get created, okay? So when I click this preview, yeah! we get fibers okay now what's going to happen here is if i zoom in close here all right and if we look at this i'm just going to look at our stream through here okay so obviously you can look and see where the mask is more relevant here and here i'm going to change the color of the fibers just so we can get a little variation between here so i'm just the base color is this red, right? And I can make it green. I can make it whatever color I want, purple. And then now I've made this teal blue. So you can see, obviously, there's a, a slight mask kind of growing to and then a 50% mask, right? So if I blur the mask, right, and then click on preview, and now let's zoom in, you can see there's variations now to the number of fibers we're getting and to the length of those fibers. So then that's... Rule number two, right, is what's going on here is the masking is playing a role in this and having an understanding if I've got a variation in a mask, you guys are going to get a variation in the fibers, right? This is crucial, okay, and helpful for getting more realistic looking fibers if you're trying to go down that path of realistic, okay? So this is one important rule for me. The number two rule is polygon size, okay? So by default, we have a slider turned on that's telling ZBrush to also look at polygon size to establish a rule. So right now our mask is on a pretty consistent based mesh, okay? 
So if we undo this and we switch to here, we'll do a little move and we'll stretch out some polygons there. Yes. Yes, I know it's simple, but basic. Great, super. Okay, and we do this. You can see that the stretched portion, right here, let me just zoom back a little bit. The stretched portion, the fibers are bigger, right? And longer, right? That's because the polygon size itself is bigger. So that's a driving force. So now you have two things here. You've got masking and polygon size. So rule one, rule two. Okay, that you've got these two factors pushing how the fibers are going to be generated and made. So this is very important to understand, and especially for what Chris's question was, was using this for 3D printing purposes. Okay, which we're going to get into, but I want to establish kind of my my things here with fiber mesh. Okay, so <clears throat> I'm just going to go backwards because I don't need that. I'm sure you guys now understand those two basic laws, if you want to call them rules. What? Okay, and we're going to preview this. Okay, number three is what I'm trying to make in fiber world is important. Am I trying to make something, excuse me, that looks more like grass? Am I trying to make something that looks more like hay? Or is this for some furry character? Or is it just like real, like human hair if I'm trying to do, right? What is it I'm trying to do? And it's important to understand that all those parameters have different number of fibers. And believe it or not, when we made this, we actually went and studied a little bit about human hair. And then the, what was, was really interesting to find out was the color of our hair, there's different number of hair strands with certain colors. So like, for example, I remember red actually has the most hair strands. Like whoever has red hair, they've got more hair particle growing from their skull compared to like a brunette or a blonde, which was, I was like, wow, that's pretty crazy. But this is kind of stuff that you'll find out. I'm like, well, all right, interesting. Um, so then obviously we needed to make a controller for this. And that's why this slider is probably one of your more important sliders, which is a max number of flat fibers. In essence, how many fibers do I want in the thousands? Okay. And this is important to understand. When I put this at one, it's 1,000 fibers. And if you guys look up here in the top left, Look up here, look up here, look up here, right? So everyone, there's your first warning, okay? Up here in the top left, okay, you have a different way to see what's going on, okay? So again, if I turn this off, okay, turn it back on, you see that it's 1,000 fibers composing of 8,000 vertex points, right? So there's 1,000 little fibers here now totaling 8,000 polygons. And there are multiple things that are getting you to a polygon count, all right? So that's where these next rules come into play. And these next two is also what's going to answer Chris's question. So I've got 1,000 fibers, but how's it getting 8,000? Like, how do those numbers come together? How does that happening? Well, that's happening because, obviously, you can see the fibers have a bend to them. So they, they have to have a bend. The only way they're going to have a bend to them is if they have enough polygons to have bends to them. So every single fiber right now has three polygons on it. So then you got to start doing that math three times a thousand. And then you start doing, there's other things here that I'm going to show you where you can also, the count number will change. Okay. So right now I'm saying a thousand, but way down here in the bottom of our cockpit, there's this profile in segments. And Chris... Chris, look up here. This is when you want to be paying attention mostly, Chris. Okay, this is this is a Lisa needs bracement, right, braces moment, along with the look up here. Okay, for those that don't know me, this is whenever I do anything like this, turn on this Lisa thing or turn on look up here. I'm giving you important information that is going to what you're trying to ask. Okay, so the segments, okay, is your polygons. Per mesh. So if I turn this to say like eight, you can see the, the fibers fall more. They got more of a bend and you can see there's a little bit of some twisting happening. And that's because right now the slider twist is turned on, right? So if I drop this slider down to like say zero, you can see the fibers now are just straight off. Okay. This is important. Again, it goes back to what I was saying. Am I making hay? Am I making grass? Am I making hair? Am I doing fur? You can see just a couple sliders, the relationship 
has shifted and changed a ton already now, right? So I want to do, let's say, I want to have some segments to start, okay? So I'll just put it, eight's a pretty good number, I'll just put it at 10, right? And right now the fibers are being pulled down and what's causing that is our gravity. So we have a gravity slider saying, hey, gravity pulls down, right? So negative Y world in essence. So the what you guys got to be looking at this is look at it based on camera view. So you're looking at our scene. So if I'm looking like I'm looking at you right now, gravity is only going one way for me. I'm sitting in my chair. If I pull my chair out from in here, I'm going to fall what? I'm going to fall down, right? So I'm going to fall this direction. Okay, but we live in the CG world in the 3D world. <clears throat> so we establish that rule of gravity going down, but my mesh can be flipped. So I can turn, if I could turn my body, like another way, right? And if my chair pulled out on me, now I'm falling onto my side and not onto my buttocks, right? So think about this sphere the same way. If I turn now and do this, right? You can see the fibers are all going a direction. If I just even just turn off the preview and turn it back on, you can see the fibers now are going a different direction. So that's the top ones now are growing out because that's what fibers, and then they're being pulled down. So that's why they have a kind of a arching. And then you can see the bottom ones are just shooting straight out because they're already shooting out to begin with off of off normals. And then now our gravity is pulling on it and telling it, go through. Okay. So anytime I move my model and update anything, in this cockpit, you can see it updates. So it's not just about turning the preview on and off. It's anything you update here, we're reevaluating the surface going, oh, okay, well, let me go through now and go through the cockpit and see what other changes you've made. Because we don't, I don't know. There's no way I would know that if you've, you've changed multiple sliders or whatever other things you want to do. So we need to update things. All right, so, so for the purpose of 3D printing, okay, and if you want to use fibers, but I would probably do something else, you know, and I'm probably going to show it anyway. So whatever. This is what's important for you, Chris, is this profile slider. Okay. So this profile slider now, what it's going to do is instead of having the fibers be a flat plane that's being shooting out from the normal, they're actually a polygon shape. So four is obviously a cube. Okay, so if we get in close, you can see that they have now volume to them, okay? So here, if we, again, change the profiles now again, let's make it go to, let's say, 10, okay? And this is just saying, hey, 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 just pick up the speed. Let's do this. I'm going to say, yes, yeah, skip the note. I get it, right? So you can see this is getting a little bit more rounded. They're almost more cylindrical, okay? So... To give you another thing now, to idea to bring in another rule, okay? So this is rule then, so we've had one, two, three, four. So segments, let's say it's counted as three, profiles four, okay? Because this would be, we're actually, we're at number five really. Let me redo my math today. <laughs> so we've had masking, we've had polygon size, we've had the number of fibers is important. Now we've had our segments is important. And then number nine is your profile. Okay, and the next is the cockpit, is number six. Okay, so in essence, if you guys start with just the first five things, thinking about, okay, what my masking control, my polygons will control, how many segments do I really want, which will depict on what I'm trying to make, and do I need a profile or not need a profile, okay? By default, everybody, I usually don't touch the profile. I usually keep it at what it's set to, by default. I usually keep this at two even, or one, right? And then it's just flat planes. But Chris is asking about 3D printing, all right? So if I'm gonna say, okay, I have a profile four because I just want to be cube-based, obviously this is very, very tiny for 3D printing, so it's gonna be something difficult to 3D print off of, okay? So I wanna have a little bit more coverage or size in my fiber. So this is the coverage slider. So if I start upping the coverage slider, you just see they get bigger. Right? So here, if we put less segments, you can see now I'm getting bigger fibers. Because when you're going to, if, if some of you have never 3D printed before, this is what you're going to need to do if you're trying to use, say, something like this to 3D print. Okay? You're going to need to have some volume there 
so that the printer can actually fill in, excuse me, what it's looking at. Okay. Now you can see uh, there's a taper happening at the end of my fiber. So they're going to a, a point. Point. And there's a reason for that. I am not only now just changing the coverage size. Okay. I also right below the coverage. I am telling the root to be a little bit bigger. So 1.25. And I'm telling the tip to be actually really tiny. So come to a point. Right, so if I change this tip slider, let's just say one, you can see now they just become blocks. You can now definitely see the cube quad shape that we're making here, right? Chris, give me a thumbs up here with me because this was your question and I'm just uh, throwing a out there for tangent, okay? And then obviously the root, if I kept going higher, you can see the roots getting bigger, right? So something like this could be important. So. What I like to do, if I'm going to use, say, something like fiber mesh for 3D printing, I'll usually put both of these starting at one, just so that I have a consistent thing being grown out from the mesh, okay? I'll say, okay, I don't need this many fibers because I know I'm going to go with a bigger profile or coverage, right? Because I know I need to 3D print this, so this needs to have some more volume to it, okay? Okay. So this is where why, what I'm about to show you, why I changed these two sliders to one and one, right? Is because this coverage slider has way more power to it than just changing only the first polygon in essence. So the thing you guys need to understand right now is I have my segments set to seven right now, right? So every single fiber has in essence seven polygons, right? So there are polygons coming off this and then now I'm also telling the profile to have four. So realistically, the number of polygons I have, you got to do like four, 400 times the number of segments times the number of profiles, right? And that's going to start giving you the number of polygons we start to have, right? Yes, French fries, wizard, French fries. So <clears throat> what I'm going to do here is in the coverage above that, there's a width profile. And then this curve is really going to give me way more power, right? So I can slowly kind of make those fibers go really large to kind of taper out, right? And so for me, if I'm trying to do something that's 3D printing that starts one and having a little bit more hair look to it, this is where I'm going to start, right? I'm going to make that base a little bit bigger just so it's got more volume there for when it's going to 3D print. Okay, because obviously if you're doing something like this, you're going to attach it to a character or something, or you're making fur, maybe for a shoulder of a knight or something, or a viking. You know, this is just things to think about, right? So, you have this ability, okay? So, this, you can add dots into it, and you can go crazy with this if you want to, right? I can make it go wider in the middle if I want, have more volume, then start tapering that down more. Obviously, if you're going to go 3D printing world, you got to be careful of your taper, right? You can't go too much because it's only, your printer is only as good as it can get, okay? So I'm going to go something a little bit more like that. And now the tip, I am going to go a little bit smaller just to give it a little bit more taper just on the tip polygon, something like that, let's just say, all right? So now what I've done here is I've got fibers that have some volume to it. Okay, and then of course I can come in here and say, you know, my length, let's make it a little bit longer. I want some more length in that, right? So now we've got more length happening through there. And then you can see you have even a length profile. So what you gotta do is you gotta add accept this. I accept the challenge. And now that you've accepted this, it creates a new subtool, okay? And if we look at this, here's your subtool. Right, and here's what we have. So we've got this, which right now has color on it too. So we've got this, it's got polygroups right here, polygroups there, okay? And then you can see there is an opening to every single one of these, right? So you're gonna need to close that off if you're gonna wanna print it, okay? So there's a couple things now. I would wanna make this a little bit more printable all right, in the sense that this, for example, if we look at this part right in here, 
right in this part right here, let me highlight it right in here. Let me make my magnifier even bigger. Let me make that magnifier as big as I can make it. Okay, so this area right there where you've got in essence three of these, and I'll make my draw size as small as I can get it. Okay, you've got three fibers, boom, 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 butting into each other, right? So this, and then yes, Night Shadow. That's a nice name. I like it. Night Shadow 8. It looks like it's been used a lot since you had to go with Night Shadow 881. Yes, I will show you how you could use it for guides inside, inside of Maya for X Gen. Sure, absolutely. No problem. Remind me after we've done this. So, <clears throat> to your questions now, that's also coming through from Randy. This is polygons. So, of course, these can be added. This is physical polygons. So, already out the gate, you already have something that is going the right direction for printable, okay? Because it's polygons. So that means is you can grab any brush, but I would recommend grabbing the groom brush. So in essence, if I want to move the hairs around a little bit, you've got all these groom brushes. So there are certain parameters to each one of these brushes. They're doing certain things, each one of them. So I like to grab a couple of them, okay? So there's here in ones that I like to use. I like to use the blower. I like to use the brush one. I also like to use the groom length, right? So this, I can make a really big brush size. And you can see, I can even stretch out. So this is saying I'm allowing stretching ability to the fibers, okay? The minute you guys make this subtool, we're tagging this mesh now. This mesh is actually tagged as a fiber mesh and ZBrush knows it. So these groom brushes are doing something in particular. So you can see there's groom length but then there's groom hair toss. This is one of my favorite grooming brushes because this allows me to see the toss the hair around, but I can't change the length. No matter how much I pull on this, right? I can't change the length. That's the difference, right? Between say the groom hair toss and the groom length. And what's happening is each one of these brushes are using something in particular, which is found in the brush palette, okay? And we make controllers just for fiber mesh only. And there's many, 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 many other, 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 other things. So right here, there's a fiber mesh menu. And you can see right in here, there is sliders here to do certain things. Okay. So this is what each brush is different. So if I switch brushes, right, if I grab now, okay, so do a mental note, everyone. I'll give you a moment. I'm going to do a screen grab right now for the menu, what it looks like now. Okay, now if I switch to the brush and go length and now go to the brush palette, you can see now a couple sliders change. The top two sliders changed, number one. So you can see the preserve length is at 50 now and forward propagation is at zero. So we go hair toss and now length. And now you guys can see those sliders changing, right? And you can see stiffness is being turned on. And then seeing length, it's not on, right? So you guys can see there are things just on and off. So in essence, you can see this groom length is just in essence the move brush with options turned on, okay? The hair toss is the nudge brush with options turned on, right? So by having a preserved length all the way to 100, that's telling this brush you're not allowed to change the length. So as an example, if I was to go here and drop this down, even just say 80, okay? Now if I pull on it, I can slowly start changing the length. And it's going to be very a slow process, okay? So that's what these are doing, right? These sliders are all doing different things. So that's what each one of these, if you guys now take the time and go through these groom brushes, some of them are based off on certain brushes, like the blower brush, for example, you scroll over it, it's based upon the nudge brush. Because you can see base type nudge there. And then it's got an alpha on it now. And this is, I like to call this like a hair dryer. So, and you guys got to think this way, right? You got to think about, think about as a human when you do the, oh, yes. I've gone too far. My Keanu Reeves, get down. I am an FBI agent. I got to play that once. In here in LA, they have a, a point break live and you go up on stage and you like audition to be the Keanu Reeves character and they picked me. It was kind of a, all right, man. 
and I got to redo the whole movie of Point Break as Keanu Reeves. It was a lot of fun. I digress. Anyways, what I'm trying to say here is, if I'm going to grab my hair and flip this over, I'm not grabbing all my hair and flipping it over. I'm grabbing a certain section and flipping it over, right? So you got to think about, I want to comb it over. I want to take a hair dryer to it, right? The hair dryer, when I take to it, it's not, it's not Blade Runner. I don't have a thing coming down on my head and whoop, just doing all my hair. We're doing it by hand. Think of these brushes in that same sense. This is just a hair dryer, what I like to call the blower, and I'm just hair drying certain parts of it, right? So you can see this will give me some erratic hair, like I'm, maybe I'm making a crazy scientist, right? That old scientist look, right? So that's going to allow me to do this. Now, we need to make this more printable, okay? So there's a couple ways you guys can go about this. Obviously, the popular route is just to go to Dynamesh. Okay, I'm going to turn off my blur and then just Dynamesh it. And then there you go. That's starting to make water tight. Okay, so obviously you have all this going on because my resolution isn't high enough. So I need a little bit more resolution and I don't want any blur. And then I would go about turning this and then there's a Dynamesh. And then it's already capping everything off for me right here. Right, so I'm already now really 90% of the way. What's happening in 3D art with Javad? How are you? Right, so this is now going to be a lot better for printable. This is obviously, when I say printable, this comes down to the technology of the printer that you're going to use as well, okay? So depending on what you're trying to make, you could go about doing something like this, right? Something that we might also want to do here um, just as maybe even to make things even simpler and maybe I'm going to divide this up. So now I have something more like this and then I'll delete those and then I'll say, okay, just close holes and then see it just capped every one of them for me. So now they're all capped. So instead of the Dynamesh sense, they were all welding together, right? Um, and it was making one big cap at the end. Okay. This is kind of, it's looking the close holes and telling them to see how there's multiple holes here I got a cap it's not just seeing there's okay there's a bunch of holes and then Dynamesh is just trying to make it nice unified okay so when I'm doing this if I'm going to go this route okay Lisa needs braces Lisa needs braces Lisa needs braces moment here the next step I would probably do knowing printers and I have a form two sitting right next to me right here uh I don't want to have internal geometry. That's pointless. I don't want that. I don't want, I don't want the printer have to worry about that, printing it, complications for supports and all that. So I'm going to throw on my gear by hitting the W key or W, 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 W dot. Okay. And then I'm going to hit this little gear symbol. And right in here, I'm going to say, you know what I want to do? I'm going to live Boolean this. So I'm going to click on this remesh by union and bada bing, bada boom. Okay, I don't know why I always say that phrase, but there you go. I just did a live Boolean. So what happened is if we zoom in close, for example, if you look at that fiber right there, you can see this is welded together now. So we actually deleted the mesh internal part that was going through the other fiber. So you had this one and then it was, it was, <laughs> I can't even turn both hands. And this one was like going through this finger. We eliminated the mesh inside by doing the live Boolean. Okay, so this is now already, this is printable, right? I can throw this to the printer, and if I've got a good enough printer that can handle this, it is printable. Me, though, I still, like, all this internal stuff inside, especially in here, I probably would not want to try and print all this gaps out and these things out, okay? So, obviously, from here, you can turn it into a Dynamesh. But another really good feature, honestly to do this, especially for printable hair, is using a very, 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 very old, 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 old feature, and that's unified skin, okay? So this is kind of like before Dynamesh. This is almost like a Dynamesh where you can make a unified skin, and then it's taking this, and then making a skin, and then this is what you get, right? It's more of a volumeizer kind of a thing, Right, so right now I just don't have enough resolution on it. So it's going to create a new tool every time you click this button. So I'm going to click this, go back, and let's just double the resolution. Let's just go to 256, okay? And I say make unify, 
right? And then it's gonna go and it makes a new skin and you can see what you start to make, right? And it's a great base to start sculpting on. So you something like this. Another way you could go too, if you don't wanna do it, you could go here. And right in here, there's a remesh option right here. So you guys can actually click on this. ZBrush will go through and make a new subtool based upon the subtools that are turned on. <coughs> and it'll weld where it needs to weld and subtract where it needs to subtract. That's why we have these also are not just for live Boolean. They're actually for this remeshing tool as well. So obviously you can see, uh, I don't have enough resolution for this again. So I would say I would probably want more resolution. I don't know, let's say in the 352 range and I hit remesh all, ZBrush looks through and then there you go. Now you guys have something like this, right? So this is sculptural as well and ready to go. Okay, Chris, so that's a way we can go, go around and getting fiber mesh, right? Now, before I move on to really a way I would also, if I'm gonna do hair for printing purposes, I'll show you actually what I would personally do if I'm not going to use fiber mesh. Uh, hold on, I'm reading a question from Randy. Joseph did the multiple noise layer trick on the mech robot to cut in and mix multiple sections. Uh, I'm not sure what trick that is. I don't know, are you talking about hollowing out something? Is that what you're talking about, Randy? I'm not... I'm not familiar what video you're talking about with Russ. He's got so many of them. So I don't know if it's a hollowing out trick that you're talking about. Okay, so to someone else that asked about using fiber mesh for next in X Gen in Maya, that's super easy to do. Okay. So you guys just turn on turn on the fibers. All right. So I'm gonna go back and not having this be crazy colors. Uh, let's go with this and then let's go with just a white base. Okay. So when you guys are looking at this, there are options right here called export curves, right? So all you have to do is click on this and then a menu is going to pop open and then you can save. So if you're going to go to Maya, you're going to need to save a Maya fi ASCII file. So this is all you need to do. Click this and then name it what you want. And then when you import this into Maya, you're going to have now curves that you can throw on for your next gen hairs. That's it. That's all you have to do. You literally have to click one button and then save the file. You don't have to do anything else. Okay. So for that person's question, I forgot who it was. Sorry. Because more things have come through in the chat. I don't remember who it was. That's it. That's all you have to do. But you got to make sure if you're going in the Maya world, you save the Maya file. You can see there's a lightweight file, there's a moto file, uh, and then there's FMG, which are for other programs. I know for 3D Studio Max, at least when we made this, you needed to use the OBJ. Um, and then the OBJ can convert it in Max and do what you need to do in 3D Studio Max. Okay, so that's all you have to do to your question. Okay, so for the hair though, honestly, I would probably do something a little bit more, do something a little different here. Okay, I would probably just quickly make something. So I will say, let's take a cube. And let's go, let's initialize. And for the time being, let's just make a cube like this. Okay, and I'm going to turn perspective off. And let's do multiple... Um, edge loops. So I'm going to go switch to my move, my Z modeler and hovering over an edge. I'm going to hold the space bar. I'm going to click multiple edges. Okay. So I'm going to click and then just put some more edges in here. I'm going to say that's, that's good enough for me. Okay. And I'm going to, let's work symmetrically now. All right. So you can see I'm symmetry, but I want to be symmetrical in the Z. So I'm going to go to my transform, turn it to Z. And then now I have Z symmetry. So now I got it on either side. So I'm going to hover over an edge and say, I'm going to mask this now. I'm just going to do one edge and then inverse that. And let's just say we do something like that for the first one. And then let's do these two on either side. Let's do maybe something a little bit more like that okay 
So that looks good. And let's go to insert multiple edge loops here as well. Let's add, yeah, that, that's enough there. So let's do again, mask, single edge. So I'm holding the space bar while I'm hovering over an edge, masking that. And then I'm holding control and I'm tapping to inverse this. Switching back to my gizmo by the W key, W, W, right? And then doing maybe a come out, right? So I want symmetrical. So now I need to be along the X, right? And making sure that whatever's happening on one side is happening on the other side for me, okay? So let's play with these two. Let's play it a little bit more different volume. Okay, let's just say something like this. All right? So it's just a just some crazy unique shape, right? That's happening through here, okay? So now what I wanna do is I wanna come here and go back to insert multiple edge loops, okay? And I'm gonna say, let's go, mm, let's go with that much. There, we'll go there, okay? So I'm gonna re-polygroup this all so it's just one. Okay, so it's just one polygroup. And I'm gonna say, all right, I want this, okay, to be one polygroup. And I want this, okay, to be another polygroup. And then to boot, I'm going to also taper this down. So I'm gonna come out of symmetry, and just taper this down and give it a little bit of a, just a bit of a taper. Not a ton, not a, not a lot of a taper, not a ton of a taper. Okay, so <clears throat> I've got this piece again, right? So I've got this yellow, I got this red, and I've got a repeating, I got a polygroup in the middle. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, how about brush, right? Create, insert, mesh, right? I'm gonna say new. So now I draw out, I get this every single time, right? So then I'm gonna say, all right, what I'd like to do is instead of just drawing it out, I want to change the stroke. Okay, so then I'm going to go through here and say in the stroke palette, I want to turn on the curve mode. And now what that's going to allow me to do is I draw out a curve and you can see what I start to get now. Right, so I got this piece being tapered a little bit and then it's going around and then you, you're ending with this at the end. Okay, so I need to fix a couple things. So right now what's happening here is I am repeating, in essence, the middle polygroup along the curve, right? And the one polygroup's the start and the other polygroup's the end, right? So when I grab this, if you guys remembered, I grabbed it like this. So then this is gonna be the start of the curve, middle of the curve that's repeating, then the end of the curve. That's what's happening here, okay? So the, the mesh, i.e. the tool, this is one of the reasons why we also call this tools is I'm now using a piece of mesh as a tool, right? So hold on, water break. Oh, today I've got tea. You gotta, you gotta hydrate people, refreshing. Okay, so what I wanna affect now is not the stroke. So I don't, I don't wanna affect how the mesh is being applied. How it's being applied is all about the stroke, okay? The mesh now is something I want to mess with, i.e. now the brush. As you can see, the mesh is the brush, i.e. now the, the mesh itself has become the tool in essence, has become the brush. So in the brush palette, okay, we've got a modifiers menu. And you can see right there, the mesh is right there, right? And below that, there are options. And right now by default, the try parts option is on. That's telling ZBrush that when you have three, count them, Un, deux, trois, or one, two, three, right? Everyone, again, Lisa needs braces moment. With three polygroups, with this option turned on, that tells ZBrush when you're going along a curve, you're going to drop one polygroup, repeat the middle polygroup, and end with the last polygroup. What I'm also going to throw into this is I'm going to weld the points, okay? And I'm going to say, let's add a little bit of resolution to the mesh along the curve. So that when I go to do this, you can see the difference now. You see what I had here on the right side and what I'm getting now on the left. Right? So you can see what I'm starting to get now. 
right? You, and hopefully now if I turn this off, you can see how this is starting to look like hair. But I'm not done there. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is, while you are going along the curve, I want something to happen to how the mesh is being applied along the curve. Okay, so what I want to do is taper, right? So in the stroke palette, again, because I want something to happen along the curve. Oh, oh your options were hidden? Uh, oh, okay, you're talking about the modifier options. Here you go, we'll do this. So here's your modifier options. So there's try parts. So let me turn this up so it's not hidden by my camera. Okay, so you got try parts, you've got weld points, and then your curve resolution. Okay. I gotta remember. What's up, Dougie? All right, so I can't make UTSI, I think it is. I don't know, my other monitor's garbage. So <clears throat> there's your options, okay? That, that's what I changed. So the left side is with weld points and curve resolution. The right side does not have weld points on and does not have the curve resolution turned up. Okay, and then now the next thing that I wanna do with this curve is I'm gonna say stroke, curve modifiers, and I'm gonna turn on the size. And below that is this graph. Okay, I'm gonna flip it vertically. And then now you can see what I start to get. You know, and I don't want that really to taper that much. That's a little ridiculous. I probably, that's good enough. Right, so now if you think about this in terms, all right, of drawing out. So if we grab, let's just grab a tool. Do, 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 do. Let's grab this guy, right? And I can't use subdivision levels. So I'm just gonna delete them for now. So now when I draw out, I'm doing this, Wee, right? And then you can see we can move them and you see it's snapping to his face and things like that. So there are other things here that I'm going to want to change, right? So I want to be able to pull on this and not have that happen in essence, right? So I can draw hair like this and you can see it's gonna try and follow the surface and if I pull on it, it'll make it nice, but you see it's moving, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm gonna tell ZBrush that when I pull on the curve in the curve mode, I don't. I want things to be locked down. So I wanna lock the start and lock the end, right? So now when I draw out, right, and I start pulling on this, you can see it doesn't pull off the surface. And so I can manipulate this however I want, right, and put this wherever I need it to go, okay? And if I want, hey, you know what, for these hairs, you can see it, it won't go through the surface, right? Maybe I want that. So in here, there's a snapping ability. So if I turn off the snap, right, you can see I can start pushing this actually into the surface, right? And so I can pull this off and see, now I can just keep making fibers, Wee. Right, and then if I tap on the surface, I draw another curve out, and then there's another one, and then I can manipulate this, right, and do this, tap the surface, and then now maybe another hair this way, and then quickly manipulate that, right, and then there's my hair. So of course, <laughs> nice hair. Of course, if I'm gonna be doing this though, right, the one important thing is, so now that you guys are understanding what I'm doing here, I would make multiple versions of this kind of this mesh. I wouldn't just have one, right? I would have probably 10 different ones and I can just cycle through them and we can even do more than this, okay? So once you apply the curve, you can't re-edit it, right? So you can see it's only one curve at a time. So there's ways to get around this though, okay? Number one, you guys could switch brushes Okay, so here I'm going to undo all this. I'm just undoing. Okay, I'm gonna switch brushes and I'm gonna switch to the curve multiple tubes. So if I click on this, right, I can draw out multiple tubes, right? And then this will allow to have multiple curves, right? So you can see I can pull on multiple curves through here. So you still have the multiple curves. And then what I can do is I can switch back to the brush that I built and tap, and then you can see they all 
swap automatically for me. Right? This is one way you can go about it. In essence, I'm using the multiple tubes allows us to do multiple curves. I personally do not do that, though. Okay? I personally prefer, if we're going back to this brush, so if we just draw out a couple of these, and I'm going to tap, and then I draw my next one, and then I tap. So I get my basic where I want these to be. Right? I draw them, kind of get them where I want. Right, and maybe you turn snap on and off. This is your world, man. I'm just living it. Right, you just get a couple certain spots, tap on the surface, draw another one. Let's move that, I'm gonna push that in. Let's push it over, something like that. Okay, and then tap on the surface again. That's gonna allow me to draw another curve. So now I have that. Okay, I want this to go into the head a little bit like that. Okay, so. I prefer, my preferred method, honestly, okay, is when we're doing this, you can see that we're just drawing out curves, right? There's polygroups being maintained as well. So you can see I still have a polygroup at the ends. I have a polygroup in the middle, right? And then this one's got a polygroup, right? So all those polygroupings being maintained. So what, all I do is I switch my brush. So I switch to the move topological. This to me is way better. Okay, so I can click on this, right? And then now I can go with a massive brush like Gigantor if I want to. And I just click on one of them and you can see I can move this around however I want now. Right, so obviously if I go with a more reasonable brush size, you can do add, and then so I can say, okay, I need this one to come out a little bit more. I'm gonna push the pink one in a little bit now. Pull the service right so I can pick and choose the geometrical shells that I want to manipulate right because really this is all I should be doing now is just going through and then just making these probably sit a little bit better so there's not so much crazy overlapping in the topology happening see something like this just touching it so there's less and this is going to make it better for printing right you only need a little bit of an overlap right to have happen there and then there you go. And now I've got this hair that I'm Medusa hair that I'm starting to make. This is the approach. If I'm going to do a 3D printing where I'm going to make like a collectible, right? And it needs to have flowing hair, right? This would be a way to go about doing it for me. Okay. So that was a super long tangent, but I think very useful. And yes, side effects. Can you nano mesh these curves? Well, you can use nano mesh itself. Sure. But you can go along and nano mesh and put a plane and then have replace that with whatever you want. You absolutely could do that if you wanted to. Okay, so that should cover the hair. Back to what I originally wanted to do here. <laughs> so back to nano tile textures. Okay. So this plugin is going to again allow us to create seamless items. So the first thing I'm going to want to do is I want to tell ZBrush. What alignment do I want? So I want a Y alignment. So it's looking from above. So which is the default. And then I'm going to say I want six divisions. So I'm going to say create new tool. And you can see what we get. We get this plane that's just sitting here in, in space. And you can see there is a resolution of six. Okay. So it's like taking a plane that started from one face and dividing it six times. But what's happening here is this plugin is using nano tile along with array mesh. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I want to tell ZBrush to take advantage of this. Right. So to start, we need an insert mesh brush. Okay. So I'm just going to grab anything right now. It's not really relevant what it is. Okay. So I'm going to say, let's grab this. Excuse me. It says IMM primitives brush. Okay. And then. I'm going to hit on the brush palette, which is the B key, B for brush. And right here, there's a button that says create nano mesh brush. So I'm going to click on that. All right. That button is actually also found on the brush palette. Okay. So it's found right here in the create. And you can see there's a create nano mesh brush. So that's where you can go get it from the UI. If you guys like this and you want to start building a custom UI with this button. 
there you go. Okay. And so now that this is a nano, 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 nano tile, you can see I get something like Z Modeler. Because what it's actually been done is we've made a new Z Modeler brush for you. And this particular one that's made now has a nano mesh selection and single polygon action. And then if I hit the M key as in multiple, you can see all these pieces of geometry are now part of this mesh. Okay, so if I hit the brush palette for B, you can see the selected brush is the last one. You can see there's a number 14 there. So it means there's 14 pieces of nano mesh in this brush that we can use. Okay, so now I can just say draw and I get this little pill. And then I can say M key and give me this cylindrical pipe. Okay, M key, give me this, this piece. Okay, and what's happening here is every single face I'm drawing a nano out, that is creating a nano system below, all right? So in the tool palette, <clears throat> you've got nano mesh. And you can see right in here, there are multiple versions of this. And you can see there's multiple index. So there's an index two, one, and zero. So in essence, three indexes. That's exactly what I've drawn out three times, right? One, two, three. Okay, I've got three indexes. So at any point here, I can go and say, you know what, index two, which is this, I wanna rotate this. So I can say, let's rotate it maybe like this. And do I wanna rotate along the Y? Maybe I wanna rotate along the Y. I don't know, what rotation do you want, right? I have the ability to rotate this any way that I want. I also have the ability to change the size on the fly if I want to. So this is the nice thing about Nano is I have this after the matter of fact, which I prefer to work this way, which is non-destructive, right? I like to have the ability to do that, right? I have to work on this. Okay, so uh, what I'm doing here is creating something tileable. So if I was to do this and start populating this, right? This is going to start wanting to be able to make this be a tileable thing. So what I actually want to do, just to give you a visual, okay, let's go ahead and hit the M key and let's just pick one of the spheres. Let's just pick that sphere. And I'm going to say, instead of one polygon, I'm going to say all polygons, okay? And then I'm going to click and drag this out and you can see that's going on every single face. And this is a perfect squared item. And we're going to have the ability with one click of the button to create tileable items here. All right. So coming back to the plugin, we first said, hey, just alignment along Y, which honestly, I've never have found a need for me to change that alignment. Your resolution really comes down to the repeating factor that you want to make, I guess, here. But realistically... If something's re repeatable or seamless, you can, in the program you're going to take it in that does and takes the file and repeats it, you can set that number to whatever you want, which is what we're going to, I'm going to show you how I do that inside of ZBrush. Okay, and this is saying right now to preview the seamless mode, okay? So what I mean by the repeating factor, if I switch the array type, right now we're more in a quad look. If I click this, Okay, it's going to go through the process and make it be more in a different type of mode where it's a mode that's more like this, right? Where you could see more of them, okay? So that's, that's the difference that you're having here, right? So there's different modes in essence here, right? It's just how many of these do you really want repeating, okay? So... Starting all over again, by default, I'm just going to say create new tileable, right? We just get this, okay? And now I know is I've got this nano, I've got on all polygons. So here's something that we can do. So as an example, let's say I'm going to, I want a brick wall, okay? That's tileable. So obviously I'm going to need a cube, all right? So I'll take this quick cube here, all right? And I'm going to first do this. I'm going to say... You know, before I do the nano, I'm going to switch to poly group. So I'm holding the space bar while I'm hovering over a face again. So I'm hovering over a face and I'm clicking on space bar. 
All right, so let me come over here so my camera is not in the way as much. Okay, and I'm telling it polygroup, and instead of single polygon, I'm going to say poly loop. Okay, and I'm going to come here into this face, and you see as I'm rotating, around and round and round we go. Okay, that yellow, that little orange or AIE yellow line you're seeing there, that's there for you, the users. Okay, and that's telling what direction should the poly loop direction go. So I wanted to go this direction. So that since the polygons in this direction are all getting this polygroup, and you know what? I want to repeat that there, and I want to repeat it there. So I want every other as an example, right? So I've got that brownish, whatever, orange tint, burnt umber look. And then there's the blue and then the burnt umber again and the blue, so forth and so on. You get, you get it. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and hover over, hover over a face, space bar it, go back to insert nano. Right. And instead of all polygons, I'm going to say polygroup all. Okay. And I'm going to say, okay, what mesh do I want? The M key. I'm going to do a cube and I'm going to draw it out. And you can see wherever there, there was blue and obviously all became green. And now I have these cubes going everywhere, right? So what I'm going to come do is come down here to the tool palette. And hey, I didn't draw that out exactly the way I wanted it. Right? So I'm going to come here into my nano state. And you can see there's the nano that's being repeated. So what's happening with this plugin, and it's not just being repeated on one plane. It's being repeated on a multiple planes is what's actually happening. He's, we're using nano mesh with array mesh to make this plugin happen. It's in essence, my favorite thing using two features. What's up pro 4210 to using multiple features to come across and coming together and they're marrying each other. Ah, love. Okay, it's like a cake in essence. We're onioning one thing on top of another. All right, so I don't like how this one's sitting. Okay, so I'm gonna fix my rotation. So let's just put it at zero. I'm gonna change my size here to one. Okay, and now it's just filled. Okay, so what's happening is the polygon sizes are filling everything, right? So there's a fit and then there's a fill. Okay, there's a fit and a fill. A fit and a fill, a fit and a fill. Okay, because this is a cube, it's really not going to affect much. So what I'm gonna do is, let's adjust the overall sizing now. Okay, so you've got a width ability. So I'm gonna say, let's go with a width of point, what's point 0.9? Yeah, let's do point 0.9. And then a length, let's do point 0.95 maybe. Right, so now you have this kind of repeating brick, right? So if I want a skinnier brick, then I would just change this right to point, I don't know, six, right? And you got a skinnier brick as an example, right? So I'm gonna keep this at like just point nine. I'm gonna do more of like tiles that are on like the floor of like say a bathroom or something like that, let's just say. Okay, so now I have this, all right, which is great. What I'm going to do now is I'm gonna copy this nano, right? So I'm gonna grab this nano and copy it. I'm gonna go back and if you remember, we've got another polygroup here, right? And we're still holding space bar. You can see I'm having insert nano mesh and I have polygroup all, right? <clears throat> so then I say, okay, this is great. So what I wanna do maybe is now come to this burnt umber and draw this out, it's becoming purple, but now all I have to do is come back and now you can see there's an index one. The first one's always gonna be an index zero, okay? The first nano is always gonna be an index zero. There's no way for you to change that. So the second one I drew out is now index one. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna paste over top index one and now you see I got the exact same thing. But what I wanna now do is have an offset, okay? So we have offset sliders here, right? So I need, I think it's gonna be along the Z. Nope, no, nope. why would it be along the Z? It'd be along the Y. And I'm gonna make an offset. So I can say 0.5, or I can say, you know what, 0.8, right? 
right? And I am creating now an offset. So if I go to one, that is an exact offset, right? So if you're looking, this one is got this, and you can see there's an offset even of the Z, right? So I'm gonna put them both at zero, and now we have something like that. So what you have now here is a repeating pattern, okay, for you. Okay, so now that I have made this, all I have to do is come through now to the plugin and say, okay, I've made this mesh how I want it. And then I say, okay, what map size do I want? Okay, do I want 512, 1024, what map size I want? And then what do you want? Okay, do I want a normal map? Do I want an albedo? Do I want a displacement, i.e. height? Do I want a polygroup ID? Right, so let's just do a BPR normal map and polygroup ID, right? And because by default this auto export is on, all I have to do now is hit create seamless maps. Okay, it's gonna say, hey, where do you wanna save these? So let's save these somewhere, all right? Let's put these on my desktop. We'll make a folder real quick here. Let me go to my desktop and make a folder so we can save these in. So we'll call this maps. Okay, and then bada bing bada boom. And then now what prefix do I want? Well, I don't know, I'm gonna say, I'll just say, I'll just call it brick for now. Okay, and then what file extension do you want? And then you hit save, and then let ZBrush start doing the rest of the work for you, right? And it's going through and rendering these out. Okay, and looking at creating something that's tall. And you can see here, I'm showing you that it's being repeated in multiple directions, right? So you have this ability to do this. This is really great to be able to switch to this, right? So you just select the ones you want, you hit, hit this, you click this, and you hit save. And then we go through and we render these out for you, right? There's the normal map and then there's the BPR and so forth and so on, right? That's it. And then now you've got maps that can be used in other locations. So here we'll do a, uh, let's also do a, let's just do a height of just this one. And I want it to go in the same folder. Let's just call this brick two. Okay, <clears throat> so this is now in essence like an alpha. I can import this if I want to and bring this in and then see now I've got a tileable alpha, right? So, so this is something else that you can do. Okay, this is a very simple, simple, simple approach. But the beauty of being in ZBrush is we've got millions of polygons that are, are our disposal. We've got other features at our disposal now to, to use this. Okay, I'm just showing right now the basics of this and the simple understandings of this, okay? So let's go a little bit further with this. Let's just start with something fresh. So I'm gonna come down here and I'm gonna say restore canvas size. And what it does is brings me back. So these bottom features radar it shows what my canvas was set to. And I'm telling, hey, restore my canvas back before I pressed this top button, create new tile tool, okay? And I'm gonna wanna do something uh, something nice. So let's go ahead and let's get rid of this, this guy. And let's just only have one subtool. It doesn't really matter to me what the subtool is. Okay, and I'm gonna say, let's initialize this. Let's do a single-sided cube. Okay, just to have something simple, okay not really relevant, honestly, what I'm doing. It's just me being me, okay? So I've got this cube, right? So if you think about it, what I'm going to do here is I'm using this cube as kind of a guide for me personally that if I'm gonna create something tileable, that tileable or seamless item needs to fit in a perfect cube, right? So then whatever I'm about to sculpt, and then now this is where the, the game steps up, because now we have ZBrush where we can sculpt in and do many other things with and then use that to create something tileable. Okay, there's 
There's going to be so many things that we're going to be able to do here. So <clears throat> I'm going to have this and I'm going to use a feature that, you know, was new. It's a new feature. Um, that's a fun feature to, to play with. I'm going to use spotlight. Okay. So I'm going to say, let's go here and draw a like box by hitting the comma key. Okay, so here's a great question from, it looks like Loser Snake Studio. Uh, hopefully, it looks what it's like. My, my text is really bad over my other monitor. Um, why sometimes the reframe the DL tool will not work properly? It's probably because you've hit the frame key. Okay, so this key right here, this frame key, you don't want to be messing with that. That changes the, how the plugin's working, how it's framing on, because there's two modes to frame. There is frame selected subtool, and then there's frame all. And because we're dealing with this plugin's using array mesh, it's actually a really big mesh. We're just not showing you the whole thing, right? So that'd be one reason why it's not working. So if it's not working for you, uh, Loser Snake Studio, hit the frame button and then try it and see if that works. Now then I would probably recommend just try restarting real quick and see maybe you did something else, which would involve me asking you more questions. <clears throat> Okay, so to the light box I go. I'm gonna go into Spotlight and I'm just gonna grab, it doesn't really, it's not really relevant to what I'm gonna grab. I'm just gonna load this. Hey, all right, perfect, yay. Okay, and so now we've got these images over here on the left, okay? And I'm gonna hit the Z key, which is in essence stands for Spotlight Edit. So I'm going in and out of spotlight edit mode. So that's when we'll pull up this dial. So I can click and drag these around and resize them. And you can see anywhere where I click, I can grab these kind of as a unit to drag around. Okay. And I'm just going to grab one. Let's just grab this guy. Okay. Using this dial, this center dial here. Look at me! Right here. Okay. Right here. Right here, people. Look at me! Okay. I can move this dial around. What I want to do is I want to snap right to the middle of this image. Okay, that's going to allow me to snap there. And then anywhere else inside the dial, it allows me now to move this image because it's the selected image. And what I can do is I can actually snap this to center points of the mesh <clears throat> or corner points and even snap to the center of the mesh. Okay. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to size this up now to where that orange border pretty much gets close enough to the border of the polygon. I don't really have to do this step. I'm just giving you guys something that I tend to do sometimes, especially if I'm going to go down the of making something very extreme and crazy <clears throat> for myself here, right? So the reason why I'm doing this is I just want more surface. So really, I could do this if I wanted to, in all honesty, people. It, it doesn't doesn't really matter. I'm just saying, I'm just giving you guys examples of what you have the power to do here. Okay. And what I'm going to do is now I'm going to move this dial away uh, out of the surface and I'm going to click on the paintbrush. Right. And by default, you can start painting in white. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch to the paintbrush number one. So I'm going to hit the B, 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 B key and then P for paint and then the paintbrush. Okay. And I'm going to throw an alpha on this. I'm going to throw a pretty strong alpha. I'm going to say 14. So you can see what my stroke is like now compared to what it was there, right? So you can see that black outline and there's not so much of a black outline here, right? So white is allowing me painting white. So you can see from over here, I'm grabbing the white color and then going. So if I hit the V key as in victory or victor, okay, this is an eraser in essence. So I can get rid of the white, in essence, what I have here now is a blank image with nothing on it. And then to ZBrush Pilot's question asking, so you could do a diamond gemstoning pattern with prongs and stuff? Yes, you can. Would that work to the flow that later on organic surface or let's say geometrical surface? Yes, you can do all that. But you got to keep in mind what we're creating right is a height map it's not a vector displacement so there's no undercutting though keep that in mind okay so what i want to do is i want to create some kind of my own pattern i just want to do something maybe different to this pattern in here okay 
So I want to do, I'm going to start painting now. I'm going to hit the V key to paint in white. Go to draw, draw size. And I'm just going to paint some kind of pattern in here. I want to do some kind of repeating floral pattern happening that I'm going to put on a surface. And I want to show you guys how I would make this. Okay. And then how I would use this with that, that tiling ability, right? And then this is the beauty. I can hit the, the V key and it allows me to erase things if I want to erase. I can go to a smaller draw size and then now my, in essence, my eraser is smaller, right? So I'm just using, <coughs> excuse me, the colors of switching from black to white to allow me to do different things through here, right? So I'm just going to do a really something very quick flower pattern. Let's just say something like this. Yeah, there. So I just want to have some kind of repeating piece. You know, do I want to have something come off here in this direction? And maybe we'll have a little something like that. Let's go a little bit bigger with my draw size and have it come off. Something like that. There, there. Happy little trees. Right, happy little trees. There you go. Okay, so I'm just making something, an organic kind of shape thing here. Is all I'm trying to do. And I know I'm going to end up repeating this. I do not like that. That was ugly. Uh, yeah, let's there. That looks good there. Okay, something like that. And then let's do a little one off like that. Okay, and maybe yeah, there, there. Beautiful. It's not beautiful, <laughs> but the idea here is I'm just free drawing however I want. And at any time I can, in essence, erase what I might not want to be there. Okay, so now that I have something going here, my next step is I want to convert this into topology because I'm going to want to sculpt on this. Okay, I'm going to want to do some other elements to this, sculptural elements to this. Hence the point of why having ZBrush is going to be good for me. Okay, so I'm going to say, all right, I'm now going to click this little snapshot 3D. Okay, so when I click that, ZBrush is looking at this and going, okay, you want me to make a piece of topology, right? That is going to be used in this cube, right? So if you look here, if I come out of this and we just rotate, you can see there's a piece of the geometry. So I'll turn this off. Right? There's an actual piece of geometry here. Okay, And what this geometry has done is it's taken on even the thickness of this cube. So this is another reason why I kind of started with the cube. Number one, I can kind of see what a perfect cube is going to look like because I know I'm going to want this repeating along multiple cubes in essence. And then number two, I'm using this as my thickness. Right, So if you look, this is what I'm getting now. Right, So... <clears throat> I'm going to spice this up a little bit more. So I'm going to come into here. I'm going to go to my geometry. Okay. And then I'm going to come into my creasing. And in here, I'm going to hold the control key and click on this and add a quick bevel in there. So now there's a nice little bevel. Uh, in deformation, I'm going to come in here to my polish groups and then kind of just polish that out even a little bit. Have them make that have a little bit of different kind of arch a little smoothness happening in there maybe now switch to my move brush right and then just start I can just even manipulate this now a little bit and at any point and this is the beauty is now we're dealing with this and I can polish that off again right and now I've got this piece that I'm starting to generate and create right <clears throat> so now I'm moving along okay here I'm gonna say okay let's put this back on okay I've got that shape now let's make something else to go along with this. Okay, so I'm gonna throw again my spotlight back on. So Shift Z, okay, will turn on and off actual spotlight. So it's the same thing as going here to the texture palette and clicking this on and off through here. Okay, and then the Z key, as in ZBrush, turns us from Edit, Essence Edit Image Mode, okay, and then non-edit ninja mode. This is a little bit like, um, it's a little bit like Shadowbox, but this is way better than Shadowbox, Shadowbox in my opinion. 
Okay, so in essence, to give you an idea how I think it's better than Shadowbox, is you've got undo ability, I can always come back to this, and I can manipulate this if I want to. So we can even say, let's take this image, all right? <clears throat> let's go ahead and I'm gonna reorganize these. So I got a perfect circle, right? So let's have some fun with this. So let's take this circle as an example. Let's size this circle up, all right? So let's just take just the circle and let's size that up. I'm gonna duplicate it, okay? So now in essence, I've got two circles. Okay, I'm gonna size the one down. All right, we'll go, let's go there. And then this little union right here, I'm gonna hold the Alt key and click. And what that did, if I size down, you can see it took a, took a cut out of the image. And then now I'm gonna just click union. And then now it's made a step. So in essence, what I have here is kind of like a bullseye, right? But I used the circle and duplicated and used it in. So this is stuff like this really opens up some things for me. Okay, so now realistically, my image is this. So see, I got this, I got these circles here, and then I got this ability, right? So I can snap here, and then I can say, okay, let's take this one, and let's snap it to there, and then I'm gonna say, I wanna union that, and then and see now it's a bullseye. That's in essence what I did. I just took another circle and told a snapshot into it. Right, so as an example, let's take now, let's take this, let's snapshot it to the middle, okay? And in scale, okay, I wanna elongate my scaling. Say something like this. So what I'm doing is I'm holding the control key and I'm just clicking at the top so I get something like this, all right? And looking at this, you know what I want to do first, actually, is make this middle part smaller. It's, it's too big. I don't like how big it is. So I'm going to edit this. So I'm going to, again, take this dial, right, the center port, and snap it to the center of the image. And another feature we have here, which is framing. So instead of just framing an image, okay, right, instead of just framing an image like that, I'm gonna hold the Alt key and I can shrink down, in essence, the middle portions, right? So now I have something more, something a little bit like that, right? So I shrunk down everything, right? So this is what I had, okay? And then I come here I s and hold the Alt key and then I can shrink this down, right? And then now you have the ability to do different things in here, right? So now I have even something like that. Okay, so what I wanna do now is take this piece, snapshot it to here, okay? I'm gonna move the dial to the bottom of the image and then snapshot that. I'm gonna hold the control key and then start dragging this out. Okay, and then being able to do things like this, right? So I this dial is my driving force, how I snapshot this. I'm gonna size this one down a little bit, maybe something like that, <clears throat> right? And now what I'm gonna do is, because I've moved the dial to the bottom of this image, I'm gonna tell it, okay, I want you to take this stretch sphere now and add it to the sphere that I'm making. <coughs> Excuse me, <clears throat> all right? So I'm gonna click this button here, that drops it. And now what I wanna do is rotate this. So I'm gonna hold the shift key, right? And I wanna rotate this image. And we'll go like that. Then I'm gonna say, go ahead and union that, right? And then I'm gonna tell it, hit the one key, union, one key, union, one key, union, one key, union. So you can see my repeating thing that I'm doing here, right? All I did in essence was told it to repeat this pattern along the way, right? As I go, right? So I'm creating some kind of different element here, right? And now maybe, you know what? I want to take this. Let's snap that to the middle. Let's do something like this. 
And now let's do that. And I'm gonna hold the Alt key and drop that down. And then now if I move that, I have that happening. Right, so you can see the spotlight allows us to grab multiple images and do multiple different things with it, right? And it can be very beneficial. I can even, right, size this down, right? And say, you know what, let's do something more like that. Okay, I'm gonna hold the shift key, make that. And then now I'm gonna, again, just click on this and I just change the image again and now I have something like that. All right, so this is this is really endless the amount I can go. So now, now I have this image, right? And then now maybe I want to say, okay, this is going to be some kind of other element in here that's going to maybe work somewhere else in the repeating pattern that I want, right? And then now all I'm going to do is I'm going to tell ZBrush to click this little camera and you can see I get the piece there right and then now I'm gonna say okay I want another one of those right here I'm gonna size it down and be smaller this time I'm gonna hold the shift key and click the camera and what that does is add it to the existing subtool so you can see now I have two and then I can say okay now I want another one there shift key camera um, let's put another one here shift key camera right so this can go on and on and on and on and on and on and on, right? There's so many elements to this, what I'm doing. So we turn off with Shift Z and we look back again. This is what I have. I have this piece that I'm using and I'm looking at, right? So I made these little gear sundial things, right? And then I've got now maybe this pattern going on here, right? Through here. Okay, but the fun doesn't end there, people. I can say, you know what, this is a cool pattern, but I'm not, I'm not feeling it. I can say, I can even do say something like this. And then for me, I would say, all right, I, let's throw on something like a ray mesh. Okay, and then I'm gonna say, give me, right now, give me eight of them. Okay, and I'm going to repeat those eight times and then I'm going to rotate them and what I want to rotate is along the Z so I'm going to say 360 degrees okay and then now I can say how many of those do I want to repeat right and then I can even switch to the dial and make maybe something more like yeah that's actually looking better yeah I like that that's looking cooler now. I'm getting a cooler pattern. So you can see all these things that I'm messing with is really thinking about, okay, how can I use these and manipulate these and play with these, right? And right now I'm using a ray mesh where I've got one piece and it's just a repeating pattern, right? I just drew something really quick. And again, if I was doing this without having to talk to you guys, I'd be going a lot faster through these, but I'm trying to make sure you understand what I'm doing here, <clears throat> right? So, okay, I like that, but now these things aren't really working for me anymore in this pattern piece that I want. So the center one looks kind of, you know, needs maybe something. So maybe what I can do here, what if I just say, all right, let's take one of these and let's split it off, okay? And I'm gonna go ahead and say, let's center it. So I'm gonna click on the dial, right? And I'm gonna say home and it's centered. Okay, and I'm gonna turn now this one off and start sizing that up. And now I've got something like that, right? So I use that one element, okay? And then I'm gonna say, okay, I want, I'm, I wanna mess a little bit more here with this repeating pattern that I'm making now around this. So how about I go into here and let's take another one of these, okay? <clears throat> So let's take this one and let's split this off, okay? And what I wanna do is I wanna take this one and actually add it to here. So I'm gonna say, you know what, let's move this. Let's say, let's center this and let's move this here. Size this down, right? So then it's sitting something like mm, there. Now let's size it down a little bit more. 
sitting there. Okay, now watch this. So we're going to say, take the one above. <coughs> Excuse me. That's an array mesh. Okay. <clears throat> then I'm going to say, let's merge that with the one below. And then now you can see I get multiple ones of them. And it's only because I just merged the top one with the bottom one and the bottom one got added to my arrays, right? So now I've got this array, right, of these pieces, right? So there's nothing stopping me from grabbing this now and saying, well, what if I made more of these? Let's, what does it look like array-wise, right? If I can make more, what if I put one also up here? What if I put one also right there? Maybe somewhere else, right? I'm just messing around now. This is this is the one thing I love about array mesh. It gives me the ability to kind of just play um, and figure out, do I want to add more elements? And obviously there's gonna be a point here where I'm getting probably a little too much going on. Uh, I'm gonna say, Maybe that one looks better there. Okay, I'm going to say that's looking good for me. Okay, so now what I have here is I've got these array mesh with a pattern that I've generated from nothing. And now I've got this cool pattern that I'm starting to make and starting to work on. And I've got now this subtool and I got this subtool. So this is one thing, right? And I can say, you know what, maybe I want this to be smaller. You know what, and kind of now, what if I, you know, let's duplicate this. You know, this is where my mind starts to go, and I start going, okay, what if I played a ray mesh with this now? Okay, and we'll turn that on, right? And I'm going to say, again, because I'm making a circular pattern, let's go rotation. Okay, I'm going to say, let's make 12. I don't know, just throwing a dart at the wall right now, 12. Right, and then I'm gonna say I need it rotating. So by turning on the floor, so I need to rotate along the Z. Right, so I need to rotate 360 degrees along the Z. I'm gonna use the gizmo, and maybe I can create a cooler looking pattern for me here. I don't, and I don't know. I'm just, I'm messing right now. I'm messing around and seeing what I could make with this and seeing what looks good, what doesn't look good, what really is kind of pulling on what I'm liking, right? Maybe size this down. Uh, I don't know. It's probably getting a little too busy now for me. But you, the whole point here is you guys can see, I, I, I can go wherever I want with this. It's just... I can even say, I don't like that particular mesh right now here. And I can say to this point, I can even say, you know, let's go grab something else maybe that's already made and generated that would probably maybe look cooler in this. So I'm gonna say, here's an IMM brush, right? I can hit the M key. See, ooh, that, that fan's pretty cool, right? So I can click on this gizmo and in preferences this time, I'm gonna turn on the IMM viewer, right? And with gizmo on, I can actually tr swap through these and see what each one's going to look like. Like, that looks pretty cool. It's very different. It's almost a flower-like. And then what's it look like if I repeat it? Like, this is the fun, this is why I lo really love a remesh. There's a lot of times I just create something I wasn't even thinking of and making just by Happy little accidents there. There, happy little trees. There, happy trees. And maybe now reducing this number. Uh, yeah, something like that. And now sizing it down a little bit more. Okay, and then I can say, meh, I don't like that at all. Okay, so let's just say for the sake, I'm happy with what I have right now. This looks good to me. I'm good to go. So now, Bring this all back to the nano tile. This is a pattern that I'm making for, say, a character that's going to go on some kind of armor. Okay? And so, because this is ZBrush, you can sculpt on this if you want. We could damage this up if we want. But we're also able to combine these pieces. So, I'm going to say now, okay, this <clears throat> array mesh. Let's go here and say, let's make this a mesh. 
Okay, it's going to make that a mesh. So now I have this, okay, as a mesh. And then I'm going to say, all right, I got this middle piece. All right, let's keep this middle piece. Maybe we'll go a little bit bigger with the middle piece, something more like that. Okay, and let's change the size of this. Let's go make sure so it's, it's actually not as deep. And let's throw the bevel on this as well to just add a little more touch to it. So again, I'm in the creasing option of my geometry, I'm holding the control key and clicking on this. And I can add a little bit of a bevel there. So now I got a bevel on that. So add a little bit of softness to that if I want to. Okay, <clears throat> so now this is the pattern that I have. And so again, coming back to here, I'm gonna merge this down now with that. So now this is my final piece. Okay, and what I want to do now is I want to turn this into a nano. Okay. So now that I have this, I want to now tell ZBrush, take this and turn it into a nano. Now here's the key thing, people, when you're going to start creating insert mesh brushes and nanos, your polygon count is going to be important. Hold on, I'm going to turn on my fan. It's getting warm in my office. Talk amongst yourselves. Coffee talk, coffee talk. Okay, so you can see this is almost a million polygons. That's really too dense to make an insert mesh brush or a nano, okay? So <clears throat> I'll show you Viper, your question is just masking by the sounds of what you're asking. You're asking, do you wanna manually damage every edge on the models? How can you procedurally do it? Uh, you could just use masking and use a procedure that I'm about to show as well. Um, and then digital plankton, you were asking a question about how are you creating the subtools from spotlight? So I showed you how I did that. Did you get that? So let me know if you got that. Okay. So what I'm going to do with this, because all I'm trying to do is make a repeating image. Really? That's all I'm. That's it. That's that's my goal right here and right now is just making a repeating image or normal map <clears throat> and go, okay, digital plankton, I'll come back to that, okay, in one second. <clears throat> so this is way too dense, this particular mesh. I would not try to make this an insert mesh brush or IE a nano mesh, which is our ultimate goal, okay? So I'm going to use another plugin that we have, okay? So I'm going to close this nano tile plugin for now, and I'm going to use Decimation Master. And what I'm going to tell ZBrush to do is just pre-process that. So what it's doing is it's looking at our mesh. You can see here in the top, it's actually going through and processing this and giving you a percentage. So this isn't that bad. This is only going to take probably I don't know, maybe 20 seconds to do. So you can see it's going pretty quick. Dougie told me to take some water. I took some water. Okay, so what we're doing here is we're looking, analyzing the mesh, and then processing it, seeing the polygon, seeing the geometry, right? Analyzing the surface, <clears throat> because right now this is a pretty easy surface. It's just flatness. There's no, there's no uh, like sculptural detail yet on this or anything like that, right? So then let's finish your ship. And we're rocking and we're rolling. Okay, so there, that pre-process is done. And now I go to the next step here, which is step three, and I just hit decimate current. And then now that dropped it to 197,000. And you saw nothing has changed. What's changed is the polygons. Okay, but nothing else is changing, right? And I can go, how about let's go down to like 5%, okay, which is going to be around 98, okay, thousand polygons, so it's 49,000 points. So this is getting better for the purpose of using it um, for an insert mesh brush. So I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna just bring it down even more. So there, that's getting a little too faceted, right? You can see I'm losing. And then the beauty here is I can go up and say, okay, let's go back. Let's go up maybe 2%. Okay, a little bit. Let's go 3%. Okay, 29,000. There, that's good enough. So I got 29,000. So I went from 987,000 points to 29,000 points, and it looks the same. The difference is my topology, which I'm not really caring about. 
okay? So now that I have this, I want to use this now with my nano tile. So the first step is this is the pattern that I want to repeat in my tiling, okay? So I'm going to say brush. I'm going to say create insert mesh brush. And I'm going to say new. So you can see here I got, let's just call this snowflake, okay? And then I'm going to say, okay, I want it, not this to be an insert mesh brush. I want it to be a nano, nano, nano. So I'm going to hit B and I'm going to hit create nano mesh. And then now what that is, is a nano. So now I'm ready to go back to my plugin with nano tile and say, okay, create new tile tool, right? This is already a nano. So I'm hovering over a face, clicking on space bar. Okay. And you know what? I want this to kind of have, so we can say all polygons and then this is, and then we can draw out what we get, right? What we want, right? So might help if I, right? This is what I want, right? I want to go to all of them, but obviously what I want is the mesh that I made, right? And all polygons, right? And then now I have this pattern, okay? But what I kind of want to do with this pattern is I want to offset it. So again, for me, the best, easiest way to do that is do a polygroup, right? This is a new polygroup, new polygroup, new polygroup. Then I come here, go back to my insert nano. Now I say polygroup all. I'm gonna draw this out. Okay, there they are. So now I know I have down here in the tool palette. Okay, <clears throat> I can come down here to nano. Here is that instance and you can see there's more there than what you guys are seeing right now, right? Because that's the array mesh part along with the nano. So if you open array mesh, you can see array mesh is actually on as well. So that's what this plugin is doing. It's combining two features. All right. And I'm going to say, all right, I want the size to be one. Okay. I want it to fit the polygon. So I don't want it to go any bigger than the polygon. Okay. And I'm going to say, you know what? I want the size to be a little bit smaller. I want a little gap. Yeah. I want a little gap in there. Right. So now I'm going to say, let's copy that. I'm going to draw in another version of this. I'm now gonna paste it. And then now I just need to offset this, okay? In the direction that I wanna offset, right? So I can even offset in the X if I want to, right? So you could go negative six here and then go to this one, right? And offset a different direction, right? And even get them to be lined back up, right? There's multiple ways we can go about doing this. So I don't want an X offset. I want a Y, let's see. A Y with a little bit of an X offset. I want something like that. Let's say negative 0.6. Let's go negative 0.5. Okay, yeah, negative 0.4. Okay, like that. So the patterns, you know, got multiple things happening there, right? So to your question, Jim, one, two, three, two. No, you cannot export a 300 DPI image from ZBrush. We don't have DPI in ZBrush. We just have resolutions that you can go uh, 1,192 pixels by, I mean, 1,000, 8,192 pixels by 8,192 pixels. But we don't have a DPI. You would have to go into another program to do that. Okay, so now that I have this, I'm gonna come over here and say, what is it that I want? Okay, I'm gonna say a 1K texture is good enough for me. All right, do I want, I want a BPR, let's say, and a height. Do I need an AO? What else do I want? Here's a polygroup ID. And in fact, if I wanna use unique polygroup IDs, then each, what this does is each union, each, um, sorry, each nano mesh gets its own polygroup if I'm turning this on. And if, with just this on, every single mesh is polygroup gets is, is is actually an id so let's let's go ahead and do that let's hit create seamless all right so let's just put a new folder in here all right and then let's go and say uh let's call this i don't know let's call this flower sure why not save that and then now it's going to go through and do all the maps that it needs to be done. 
okay? So now that I have these maps, they're done, okay? And if we want, we can now import these, okay? So you can see, even right here, the maps are right here. So you can see the ID one, there's the ID one. And if you remember, I made the plane have two polygroups, so that's why there's the two polygroups. And then the flowered pattern thing has its own polygroup. So obviously you can do this. Um, I say for this, this is a great question, Randy. And Randy's asking, what's the difference between using 1024 or 4096? You know, obviously that's just resolution. 1024 pixels by 1024 pixels or 4000 by 96,000 by 4000. Or IE, what they call in the industry, 1K map or a 4K map, right? So the easiest thing way to think about this is how you plan to go use it now, right? Depending on what you do for a living, you know, if you're a gaming artist, you might not get the luxury for, say, this pattern to use 4096 by 4000, a 4K map. Your boss might come to you. You're only getting to use like a 512 by 512. Or if you're lucky, maybe a 1K, a 1K map. Okay, I'm planning to just use this in ZBrush. So I'm just doing a 1K map because I know I'm going to tell inside of ZBrush, now apply this and just tell it to repeat infinitely, right? So th look at it this way. A 1K map has about 1.1 million pixels in it, in essence. So what you do is you multiply the 1024 by 1024. So 4K has about 16 million pixels in it, right? So the more pixels you have, obviously the better quality you're going to have, right? So i.e. if I'm going to go grab an image and I want to apply it where I'm going to go use it now as a mask, it's probably better to have a little bit higher image size than 1K. I probably would probably go more in the 2K range, maybe the 4K range, okay, to answer your question. So again, now that I have this, let's go back to this and now let's put that, let's put that in practice. We got these images, okay, and now I want to put them in practice. So I'm going to import the height flower image okay so there it's an alpha that i have so you can see there's an alpha of this now <clears throat> that i can use on a brush inside of zbrush i can use it any way i want right so number one is using it with a brush so i'm just going to get rid of this and so let's go ahead and grab a plain cube right and i'm going to divide this up a little bit and let's even turn this into a dynamesh no, I don't want to keep that. So I got a Dynamesh, right? So if I switch to say a standard brush, okay? And I do a drag rec, okay? And then now I grab that alpha. This is what I'm getting, right? So that pattern now is going along here, okay? And I can say, okay, that's a little too intense and I want the focal shift to be a negative. So I get that. Right, so now I have this pattern being sculpted in my surface. So I can do a negative if I want to, right? I can come over here to my alpha palette and come here to modify and I can even tile it. I can say, let's tile it four by four, right? So now I'm just gonna even get more of these little flower patterns repeating, right? So you can see sculpturally now I can apply this pattern and do whatever I want, right? I can even have some fun with this. I can use it as a mask as well. So I can say, let's not have that on there. And let's, let's use, say something like this even, and then say something like this, right? And then I inverse that. And then now back to this, when I draw it out, see that flower pattern now is only going in the area where I unmasked, okay? So you can do something like this with it. I'm gonna put the repeating back to one and one, okay? And I'm gonna switch my stroke to dots. And so now what this is doing is just drawing out this pattern along in a stroke. Okay, and then now I can do this, right? So I can tell ZBrush, you know what I want you to do is kind of old school like Play-Doh, like roll it onto the surface. So in the stroke palette, I'm gonna go into modifiers and click on roll. And then now what I can do is I draw, I'm rolling that pattern. So in essence, it stomps one and then starts stomping another, right? It's hard to show really slow because then they're gonna just stamp on, see there's one, another, and another, and another. So if I'm going at regular speed, they just keep going along, right? They keep 
going along that pattern. Right? So this is an example of me. Okay, I used ZBrush to make the pattern. Then I used Tile to create a tileable pattern for me. But this is where I also really think this comes in handy for me. So let's say we've got, let's take this guy, right? And we're going to start making some items for him. So he's got multiple sub tools. So the only thing I want to look at is say this guy. And I'm going to say he's got layers. So I'm going to get rid of the layers and just bake them all in. I'm going to switch to my topology brush. Okay. And I'm going to make something really quick here. So I'm just going to draw out some curves here. And then I'm going to draw across here. All right. And then come across here. And then keep going. Come across. Come across. All right. And maybe come across there. Come across there. All right. And then I'm going to tap. And now I have this piece here. Okay, and I'm gonna separate that. I'm just gonna split on mass points. Okay, and now I have this piece. I'm gonna switch to my Z Modeler brush. I know I'm going through this really fast, people, because I'm running out of time. Um, but I just wanna get your mind wrapped around what, what you can do with this. So I'm gonna say Polygroup All. Let's change the width of this, change the height of that. Okay. I'm going to create that. Then I'm going to say, let's poly loop that. Pull that out. New poly loop. And now look at it dynamic. Now I have something like this. Okay. So what I've done is I've turned on dynamic subdiv. I'm looking at the smooth number here. And I'm even going to drop down and say something like this. Okay, so this is some kind of just pattern armor thing that I have on my guy here now, right? And now what I want to do is I want to put that pattern that I've been making and I want to put it right here. I want to put it on that portion, okay, of what I'm making. So <clears throat> what we can do and to, the, to some of the questions that were coming through procedurally do things or do things that I don't have to sit there and sculpt by hand. I'm going to go into my surface area here. Okay. And then I'm going to say noise as a noise. Right. And what I get now is my little armor piece, right? With some little bit noise. I'm going to bump up my strength a little bit so you can see what's happening there. Okay. And down here I can say alpha. So I'm going to say, alpha and we want the flower height and now you can see that image has been brought in to this surface noise so what we have here now is we have two noises we've got this noise here okay that's giving that kind of noisy noisy look on this and then now we've got this noise which is my image here okay so there's a noise scale would you see this will scale this noise, this graphical noise. So you can see this graphical noise now, right? Through here. Right? <clears throat> so that's what this is. Okay? And then you got this noise, which is my image pattern, right? Which you can see. And so if I start bumping up this, you can see what's going on. Now, this is why I wasn't concerned about, say, the image size per se. Because I knew I was going to go do this, and I knew I'd have this slider to change the sizing of that pattern at any point in time. Right? So when I hit OK, this is what we get. Now, a problem that we have is this stretching that's happening there. Right? Because this noise is just being applied in 3D based on camera. So it's just stretching across there. So I'm going to use yet another plugin. Okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell ZBrush in the plugin, so I'm going to dock this again, okay? <clears throat> and the plugin I'm going to use is UV Master, all right? Sorry, I just needed a drink. Now, I'm going to look at my polyframe mode because there's something very important for me here that I want to look at, and it's my polygroups, okay? So you can see this is a polygroup, 
and then there's multiple other polygroups here. So I want, say, that to be a polygroup, and that, and that, and so all of this, I'm good with that being one polygroup, and then these pieces will make those be those polygroups, and in fact, I'm gonna auto group them and make them be two different groups. So what I have here now are three polygroups, right? I've got like an orangish, yellowish, orange tone, purple, and then a blue, okay? <clears throat> I'm gonna tell ZBrush, okay, let's go to UV Master. Let's let's go ahead and work on the clone. So what that does is makes a copy tool for us, right? And so now that I have this copy tool ability, I can say, let's make some UVs for this, right? And then now that I have this copy tool, I'm gonna to say, all right, let's turn on the polygroup option I'll keep symmetrical and let me just unwrap. There it's done, let me flatten. And then this is what we start to get, right? We start to get kind of the this, this mesh here and these patterns here that we have, right? And we have different ways to look at this. So I can say unflatten and this is what we have. And I can even say, you know what? Let's go up one more. Maybe, you know, I want the noise to come up into that. And now let me unwrap that, right? And then I flatten that, right? And see now I got a different flatten. So what's important to me is this pink part because that's where I want the noise to actually go, all right? <clears throat> so I've just unwrapped it by saying sym symmetry and polygroup, okay? So what I'm gonna do now is copy the UVs, come back down to the mesh you can see here there was a cloned version right here, so where it says CL, and then here's the other version, okay? And then now I'm just going to paste those UVs, right? And then now, looking even at Morph UV, we can look at what we have. And here, I'm gonna turn the bump off. We don't need any bump, okay? And you can see what we have, right? We've got our UVs, okay? So I unmorph UV that. And then now if we come back to our surface noise, right? We've got our pattern here. Let's go into edit. Okay. And I'm going to frame that. And instead of doing a 3D, I'm going to do a UV. And you can see our pattern is now falling the way I would want it to fall. Okay. And I can see the alpha is just a way too much. So let's go that. Let's do this. Let's maybe do a mixture. That, and I think this is a little too aggressive. Just have a little bit, uh, just a little bit of noise in there. And maybe a little bit more of the pattern coming through. Okay, and I say okay. Right? And then so now this is what I start to get. But what I want is just only this polygroup to get it, right? I only want one polygroup to get it. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna tell ZBrush, hey, I need more, more geometry, okay? So right now I'm just looking at a dynamic preview of what this could look like, right? So now I'm gonna say apply and it's gonna create subdivisions for me now, right? And then so now I got 28,000, I'm gonna go a lot more than that. I'm gonna divide up, there's 1.8. I'm gonna go 7 million, okay? So now I'm at 7 million. So now I can look at this purple piece, right? And you can see I can put only that pattern now in the purple piece, right? And then now you guys can do this, right? I can do a, a render, which is a BPR, which is Shift R. And right now we're looking at the noise more as a bump map, but you can see what's really gonna happen to the noise, right? So this is pushing the pattern out. So when you guys render, which is the same as hitting this BPR render button, and you can see the shortcut is Shift R, that is going to show you what would this look like if I applied it, right? Because what this pushing out, what's controlling that push out everybody, is this strength that you're doing right in here, right? 
So if this strength is down, I can go obviously the opposite and be positive or negative. If I say okay, and then now I do a another render here, shift R. Let's see what this is. There, so you can see it's more subtle of a pushing out. Okay, so me personally, what I like to do here with this, when I'm trying to do something like this, where I'm trying to make a repeating pattern, and I'm trying to put it on a character, or something like that, I'm using the UVs to do that, okay? Give me the ability to do this. So, <clears throat> what I like to do is actually put this noise back up a little bit more. So let's go back to maybe this strength, where I have a lot more noise pushing happening. And let's go even, let's go even more. Let's bump that up even more. And then now let's render that out. So rendering it out will give you guys a preview. In essence, it'll give you what's going to look like if you tell it to apply. Because you can see there's an apply to mesh there. Right? There's even a point where you guys can just say make by noise. So this is a mask. So it's making a mask based upon the noise that I have. So you can see now there's a mask and I can even inverse the mask and do the opposite, right? Right, or I can even inverse the mask and tell it unmasked by noise. So the part that is masked is now going to be used as the driving force for the noise. So you can see everything else now, you got what you got and now I can inverse this and then you got opposites here. There's multiple ways to go about this, okay? But what I wanna do is tell ZBrush, let's apply the noise, but this is what I like to do. I like to create a layer, okay? And I got a layer now in record mode. And then I like to say, apply to mesh, right? And so we know this is going to apply now to the mesh and it's gonna apply a pretty big push. You can see it's applied. So my noise is turned off now but I've got all of this in a layer. So what I've stored in here now is a mask and this push surface, right? So you can see up here now, I've turned it into an eyeball mode. If I click on next to it to record mode, right? I can be back in record mode and add to the layer or go back in eyeball mode. And the reason why I like this is I can go, you know what, mm, I'm not sure. Let me dial this back a little bit. So. This allows me to, depending on when I apply this and when I get everything else involved in the character, my original thought of how strong I wanted this pattern might have not been the right one, right? So I can go do this or I can even switch to a negative on the fly. So now I'm pushing in instead of pulling out, right? So I switch to a negative. So this is the beauty of putting it on a layer is I can go back and forth, right? And if I didn't even put enough push in this, you have a magnifying slider in here in the layer system that I can keep pushing out. <laughs> and now it's just ridiculous, right? So I can go, go five times more strength if I want to. Okay, so here you guys want a different material. So here we can probably grab some kind of more metal. Here's shiny material. If it's going to be some kind of piece. So you can see five is ridiculous. I would say like 0.5 is probably pretty good. Especially if you're going to live in my world of 3D printing a lot. You need 0.3. And then there you go. Right, but you guys got to remember where we started with this whole conversation was making this pattern with I just use spotlight, which I'm gonna come back. I haven't forgotten your question, whoever it was, right? But you guys can use anything. I saw someone say shadow box. This is the point. I can grab a sculpt and then turn that into a nano mesh and then you make the nano tile to tile across and go and make something, right? And then now I'm just putting that into practice. And now I've put it into another feature or surface noise and then I've used UVing to get the pattern the way I want it to be on this particular mech. Right? And it this is it doesn't end there. We can turn this off, right? And I still have this purple piece. Right? So we can I can shrink down a couple times the selection here. Right? So in essence, we can walk down 
couple levels here. Let's say, here, let's go this many. Right, so I have something like this. You guys can even do this. What You could shrink it, right? Control W, shrink it again, Control W. And you see I got this yellow and purple. Maybe you guys only want the pattern in the purple. And then you're going to put another pattern in the yellow. You're going to put another pattern in the blue. It's your world, man. I'm just, I'm just here, right? So now that you have this, you can just say, okay, I only want that purple part to get it, right? I only want this part to have it. That's it. Okay, and then now, of course, if I turn on my surface noise now, you can see that pattern's only going there. If I hide my mask with Control H, this is now what I'm getting. Right, so it really comes down to us. And then note, Nano Tile is, yes, a plugin you have to add to, it does not ship with ZBrush. You have to add it. Okay, so again, <coughs> excuse me. You have to come here to the Pixelogic website Okay, so pixelogic.com. And up here in support, you got to come down into here and you want to go to resources. Okay, and then when you go to resources, you have to go into to this plugin section right here and then scroll down towards the bottom and you will get the NanoTile plugin right here. Okay, so the person's question, can you do the same thing with VDM tiles? Uh, no, because nano tile is, is a mesh. Uh, where VDM is sculpting into the surface, Randy. That's, that, those are different worlds. So that's what I talked about last week. VDM is more sculptural change to a mesh. Insert mesh brushes and nanos are adding topology to already an existing topology. Or VDMs are carving into the polish that you have now. That's the big. That's one of the big differences that we have, right? Um, to the person's question, because they've been waiting patiently. Hopefully, you're still in here. They were asking me about the spotlight stuff. How I was adding things as sub tools. <clears throat> okay. So again, whatever mesh, okay, that you have selected. Okay, so right now I got this cube selected, right? This is my sub tool. And you see it's got a certain certain depth to it, right? So what I mean by depth is it's got a certain depth here. Okay, so if I'm doing this, that depth now is looking at the camera and it's a certain depth from the front of the camera to the back of the camera, right? And now what I'm telling ZBrush is, okay, this cool shape here I love so much, awesome. I want to make it a new sub tool. So all you do is click on this camera. That's it. That's all you got to do. I click on that camera and you can see it makes it a new sub tool. And right now I have solo mode on. Okay. And so now this mesh is created, right? So now you have that. And there's the physical piece of geometry. Okay. Now as a user, we can add. So if we say here, let's grab something else. Here we'll go to spotlight. Uh, let's grab, say this. Okay. And let's say now, Hey, I want the Z man logo size it up. Okay. If I click this camera, you can see it makes the mesh and makes it another sub tool. Now, if I want to add another piece of topology to the existing sub tool. Okay. I click on another piece and instead of clicking on the camera, I hold the shift key and click on the camera. And it adds the mesh, but what it's done, as you can see, it's added to the subtool I've already had it clicked on, right? The subtool I've already had clicked it. Now, the thing to understand is when you go to create these, the thickness is determined by the, the mesh that you were actually selected. Okay, so what I mean by that is now we have, okay, so now we have this. So if I change the, the thickness of this, did we say something like that? Okay, that is now the selected subtool. We bring back this spotlight and let's say we grab this. Okay, and I click hold and I click on the camera, and now it's I know it's gonna make a new subtool, but it also makes a new subtool the same distance. Right? And of course if I hold the shift key, 
it's adding to the existing subtool which you're going to get the same the same distance anyways right so it's the same depth right there now where the fun part comes in with all this people is using live booleans right and i know i've done a uh i've done a stream on this before but so just give me a recourse so i can say i can grab this and say hey let me snap it there and let me do this okay and what i'm going to do is i'm going to tell zbrush this little cylindrical piece i want it to be a cutout so with the camera i'm going to hold the alt key and click camera okay and that automatically if you can see right here the icon is switched to the second one which that's subtractive so now if I turn on live booleans up here, you can see that cuts out. So what all I've done here now, right, is made a piece of geometry that's a circular cutout. Right? And I can now do whatever I want with this. Right? I can make it. Right? So this is what the piece is, right? It's this. Right? It's the same thing, but I, by default, made it a cut and now you have that ability right i'm just messing around now with the subtool to give you the idea of what this can be right and i can do this and then i can mirror and weld over if i want to if i want on the other side so i turn on my floor grid i need to mirror and weld along the z So I come down here, come to my geometry, come to modify, and then you got a mirror and weld right here. So I can turn it on to Z and then mirror and weld, right? And then this is going to mirror and weld across the surface, right? And look at it and say mirror and weld over, right? So this is also sitting over there. Is that make sense to you right so i can mask this off and in essence do this and then i'm going to turn on local now and do a mirror weld again and then there i have the same thing on both sides and there you go i got them both on the same sides you can install zbrush in 2019 version but it's a free upgrade to 2020. we don't have the plugin of 2019 anymore on the website because we offer free upgrades. So ZBrush 2020, you can, if you have 2019, just upgrade to 2020, it's free. And then you can, that, because that nano tile where I just showed you this, this is only good, this version is only good for 2020. This is going to probably cause problems in 2019's version. But right now, the only thing we have here are 2020s because we only offer support on the most recent version because of free upgrades. We don't offer support in old versions as much as we would, uh, as much as the current version because it's a free upgrade. In a lot of cases, things that you might be running into an old version, if it's exactly what we fixed in the next version. Mm, well, I would then would create a support ticket, 3D art and there might be something else going on um, because the stability wise I've been using 2020 for for a long time now almost for me almost a year and I on multiple different computers and I don't have any stability issues compared to say 2019 okay so if you want to create a support ticket and then we can ask you more questions and see there might be something going on with your system with let me ask you a real quick question are you using a amd ryzen or threadripper processor i'm just going through the questions okay i know the person was asked did i answer that question the person was asking me about about that It could be your system. I don't know. It's tough to say. That's why I say there's a lot of questions that go back and forth. 
to ask you. That's why I say create a support ticket. And that way one of us can go back and forth with you and troubleshoot with you. Um, the only reason why I'm bringing up Horizon or Threadripper um, is we have found that uh, in some of the generations, it's actually best to um, drop down your max processor usage. Um, so I know this is an example for people, if anybody's got one of those processors um, and have seen some stability issues. Um, one thing I've been using for people that have seen stability issues on, on that, okay, is um, <clears throat> this is a fix that has solved the problem for anybody. For people that have a thread ripper or Ryzen, it's just something we've seen for some people, not all people. So go to your power options. And in here, I have it set at high performance. I don't have it at balance because I don't want the operating system fluctuating my processor. Um, so then I change plan settings. And then I go to advanced power settings in here. And then that'll open up this menu. And in this menu, okay, there is options for processor power management and you see maximum processor state, you see I have mine set to 90% because I'm actually on a thread ripper. So <clears throat> I we have found people that have had any issues with say a thread ripper or even sometimes a Ryzen and then they've had crashes that they normally wouldn't have had for some reason. Every person that I've talked to now that has done this, the crashes have stopped. So just something maybe you try. Now your i5 processor, that is old. So it might be just because it's an older processor you know, and obviously as we keep updating versions, we're taking advantage of more technology coming along in the processor worlds. And your processor doesn't have any of that technology anymore. Right? So it could be something as simple as that. It's just your processor, period. And then now it's it's at the point now where it's reached maybe a plateau to what we as developers across all softwares are trying to do with as new stuff keeps coming out. We got to update our code to also keep up with the new hardware. Okay, um, I got like maybe 10 more minutes. Um, I, I got to get going. I got to get going into another meeting. Um, so I know Black Pixel, you're asking about like the curve stuff in here, <clears throat> right? This is a pretty big conversation. So this is this is in essence your your driver for um uh, your, your brushes, right? So when you switch brushes, each one of these curves are gonna be a little different, right? So this is just an edit curve as far as your, your strengthening of your curve, your fade off, right? Do you want a consistent, subtle fade off with the curve, okay? And then you got a pen curve and you have a zero curve. So there's different things <clears throat> depending on the brush that you're gonna have through this. This is getting pretty deep down the rabbit hole and I don't have enough time, unfortunately. It's maybe something I'm going to be streaming game on Thursday. So maybe I can, if you're going to be available on Thursday, we're going to be going into a new stream on Thursday. We're going to be doing part, I think we're on part four of my sci-fi ship, turning it into a cool poster. AccuCurve um, is a very beneficial thing. It's to help narrow down your brush stroke a little bit. And it works really well with certain brushes. And then there's other brushes you ain't going to see really much difference at all. So I just don't have enough time to really dive in all of that in five minutes. Uh, I'd rather give it some time so we can see, I can try and make time for it on Thursday. And then again, obviously you guys are seeing Joseph dresses tomorrow. I'm again on Thursday. Solomon Blair is also on Thursday. And then Joseph dresses again on Friday. So you guys, we, ha we are streaming as developers every single day, Monday through Friday. And then some days you can see we're streaming multiple times. And... Uh, Solomon's streaming in ZBrush Core on Thursday, and so is Dice K. He's streaming in ZBrush Core on Monday morning. So I encourage you guys, this is great. I love this interaction with you all and being able to talk to you and answer as many questions as I can. Um, if there's anything else based upon what I was talking about here, um, if there's any other questions I can ask before I gotta go, unfortunately, I gotta get out to another meeting, guys. I wish I could stay longer, but I, I my schedule. Won't permit it. Uh, for as far as printing, one million points. No, that's fine. That that's gonna come down to your the software of the printer. I'm assuming that Tassos, you're. 
I'm assuming you're referring to 3D printing. No, I drop like a million polygons in the software for my form two, which is preform. That's what it comes down to. It comes down to them, their software, what it can handle. Some, some 3D printing software for certain printers, they can only handle a certain file size. It's not even the number of points, it's a file size. And then some of them, yeah, will only handle certain uh, point levels. So that's why you would need to use something like a decimation master. <clears throat> Taco Tuesday, we should all have like, I'm streaming every Tuesday, so I'll be streaming again next Tuesday. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, this segment also for me has always been requests from you guys. Is there something in particular that people really want to know more about? Obviously, at the beginning of this, we went on a super tangent with the, uh, with the fiber mesh, but I thought it was really good. And then we got into what I was wanting to cover today. But if there's anything else in particular, by all means, start typing that in the chat right now because I can still see the chat. Maybe I'll pick something from what you guys are asking to learn more about. And next Tuesday. So my Tuesday streams right now, which are always this time, 3 p.m. Okay, but keep an eye on our schedule because that will change <clears throat> depending on other things that are going on. So if you go to uh, ZBrush Live here, okay, <clears throat> which let me, let me, here, right? You can go to your schedule. So you, some of you are watching here and right here you can see a schedule. So make sure you're keeping up on this because this is ever growing. Like we literally just added Solomon's stream this Thursday, today, right? So his stream was just literally added today, this stream right here where he's going at two o'clock. Okay, so if you want to, all right, make sure you're keeping an eye on this because it's always going to grow. It's like growth, we're doing this for you. The users, 80s version users, or if we want to get in the 2000s version, da -da -da -da, the users, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, well, I devote two hours to discussing Red Wax. Absolutely. Realistically, honestly, uh, I love the 80s, man. Honestly, if you want to even learn more about how even the Red Wax, something like you could create your own type of Red Wax in your old filters, that's totally possible possible to do okay so uh, even if you want to go down that for a top sorry my daughter's standing outside my office in the rain now sorry Lola I'm in a, I'm in a meeting I'm gonna say hello to my daughter this is Lola so um if you if you guys want me to go through the materials no I don't if you want to go through the materials what's this what's this iced tea Sorry. Um, uh, is creating an IM curve brush, is there a way to make the geo attach from end to end curve rather than just mesh the center? Yeah, you can you can ad you can address that. Hold on, please, hold on. Okay, if you want to there's a here's a little trick for you. If you want to go around a surface, as an example, the fastest way to do that is if I grab the IM curve brush here, okay, and I'm gonna turn on my this again okay if you draw it out and hold the shift key okay you'll have a curve that goes around the whole thing okay so this is how i do it so i'd probably go with a little bit so something like this and you can see all that's going around and then connecting okay so that is one way again just hold the shift key and draw off the surface okay and then now you you'll see Okay, that is one way to do that. Or don't forget, another great technique that I like to use where I can have control is using like the slice curve ability to do stuff like this and like this. And then now I can go to the stroke curve functions and tell to only do polygroup or framing of the mesh by polygroup. And now you just tap on any one of the curves and then this is what you get. <clears throat> like I use this one a lot. I use the polygrouping one option a lot. Right? Yeah. Sorry. It's just, it's raining now and I didn't, I didn't want her standing outside in the rain pounding on the door. Sorry about that. Um, so that'd be a way I would do something like that. Okay. So again, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. This is, I, I love interacting with you guys. This is great. And uh, I'm just looking through to see if there's anything else that we can look at that you guys suggested. 
And absolutely, you can use the map. The whole point of nanotiles also using the maps. Bless me. In other applications. Right? 100%. You can use them. In, that's the whole point, too, is you can export them in other applications. That's why there's all those passes for you. Okay, everyone, please stay safe. All right? Uh, I know it's scary out there. All of us are working from home, I'm sure, now across the world. Thank you for tuning in, no matter where you are in the world. I appreciate it. I, I love being able to communicate with you guys. For me, live streaming is way better than making a video because we can do this interaction, and then I can go on my crazy tangents, which I love to do because I love to give you as much information I could possibly give you. All right, so everyone be safe. Have a wonderful evening for those on the East Coast, North America, and West Coast now. Everyone else in the world, wherever you are in your time zone, whether it be the evening or the morning, be safe. Thank you for tuning in. I got to get going to my next meeting. Paul is out. Bye!